Hey guys, I'm Steve. Uh, Steve. I work at a company called Lessonly. Uh, we have t-shirts. And I'm going to be talking about load testing Rails apps and three particular tools um, that I've used to that end. Apache Bench, also known as DB, Siege, and JMeter, which is a Java uh, testing app that's pretty heavy duty but very powerful. Um, just to get a sense of the audience here, who has heard of load testing? All right, most people. Who has done load testing? Slightly fewer. Who thinks they're good at load testing? Nobody. <laughs> All right. That makes none of us, because I put myself in the second group. Um, I've uh, just started working at a startup a few months ago, and I've had to deal with some uh, traffic levels on the Ruby on Rails apps that I build that are beyond what I was used to. And so I tried to learn a little bit about load testing and how to make sure the, the changes that I make and the things that I deploy can hold up under load before we shift to production. I'm going to talk a little bit about what load testing is. Um, <clears throat> essentially, we all do load testing in production, uh, which is when you have, a, you know, when you're directing a bunch of traffic to your app, um, <clears throat> seeing how it, how it behaves and how it behaves differently when it's under load, as opposed to, for instance, in development. Uh, when it's just you poking around, or maybe in a QA environment, you've got a, a few people poking around. Uh, the goal of load testing is to simulate uh, real-world traffic conditions. So lots of users, lots of things happening at once. And, uh, uh, there are several kinds of load testing. Um, I may misspeak and refer to some as the other. It's, it's a little confusing. There's some overlapping. Um, generic load testing is just uh, sending large amounts of traffic to an app. So more than just a few people poking around. Um, and the, well, I'll get into the different uh, pluses and minuses of all of them. There's another kind of load testing called performance benchmarking, where the goal of that is to uh, you know, get a, a, a number. Um, perhaps you have a goal for certain response times or other things like that. And you want to compare um, across deploys or over time how your app's holding up. Uh, and then finally, there's stress testing, which is overloading your app and, and making sure it behaves uh, in a, a graceful way even when it fails and has to restart itself. Uh, <clears throat> there's also surprise load testing. Most of the tools we're going to look at, um, you should really only direct them at your own servers. Uh, <laughs> unless you want to have a good time with some of your friends and, and DDoS them. Uh, but it, it's basically the same idea, that you're sending a bunch of traffic. So generic load testing. Um, the way it kind of works is you want to just increase load on a system until uh, you reach whatever your uh, expected uh, real world conditions are uh, in order to see how it behaves under load as opposed to when it's just you know in development one or a few people uh, using it. And that's because there are some problems uh, such as memory leaks or other race conditions that may only reveal themselves when there's a lot of traffic on an app. Uh, so this answers the question. How does my app behave, or how does the behavior change with a lot of people using it? Performance benchmarking is a different kind of load testing. Um, and the goal with that is really <coughs> scientific. You want to get metrics, and you want to make them reproducible so that over time, um, and certainly in response to changes that you make, you can say, all right, how does this change affect my app's ability to hold up under load? Uh, so the goal with that is to establish a baseline that you can repeat regularly. And you know that's something to judge any any changes that you make. You know you may think, okay, this is probably an optimization, but until you do a load test and see that response times go down or uh, that the app otherwise changes in, in a way that you expect, you don't really know. Uh, <clears throat> and then stress testing, uh, as I mentioned before, that's just load testing and overload testing. Um, and in certain systems, it may be important that your app fails gracefully and recovers gracefully. Uh, and so stress testing is basically how you, how you can test that. Uh, yeah. So something I first wondered when I was learning about load testing is, can I do this in development? And from what I learned uh, and from some experience, the answer is technically yes, but you probably shouldn't. Um, there's a few reasons why. One is the entire goal of load testing is to match a production environment. You want to know that because your app behaves a certain way under load testing, it's pretty much going to behave that way when you deploy it. Um, you know, depending on your development machine, it may have a different operating system, certainly different uh, 
you know, different stuff going on. Uh, there's just a lot of variables, and so it's hard to draw those conclusions where you know, it behaves this way in development. You may not know that it's going to behave the same way in production. Uh, that's kind of the second bullet point, too. Uh, and then the third one I, I ran into is there's this sort of feedback loop. Uh, load testing, especially at high volume, um, actually taxes the system you're running the tests on. And the whole point of load testing is to tax the system that's responding to those requests. So you get this weird feedback loop where as you're, uh, if you're testing on the same machine that's being tested, the harder it's working to test, the, the less hard it can work to respond to that test, if that makes any sense. Um, so definitely a best practice when you're doing load testing is use a staging environment. Um, you know, if you can set something up, Heroku makes it really easy, as, as similar as possible to your production environment. Um, that way you can avoid all these issues and hopefully get more consistent results. All right, so let's get into it. Um, I'm gonna start talking about Apache Bench. Uh, Apache Bench, or AB, comes with a lot of computers. I think Linux and uh, OS X have it by default. Um, you can download it for Windows, and it's the AB command. Uh, <clears throat> You uh, basically just pass in different flags in order to generate traffic loads. So here's a very simple test. Um, N is for the number of requests, so 100 requests. Uh, C is concurrency. So this is going to be 100 requests, 10 at a time, so 10 series of requests. Um, and it just starts those. As soon as one finishes, it starts the next one. And you can see here the, uh, the start of the results. Um, so it's really simple to use. And I'm throwing this against the beta site for my personal blog. Um, you can see how long it takes for the test. Uh, completed, failed, if there are any errors. Uh, request per second is a, a useful benchmark. Um, you know, if you're doing load testing in order to meet a requirement, um, there's a good chance that requirement might be, OK, so we're expecting 200 requests per second. 1,000 requests per second. Um, this is what we have to meet. And so a benchmark like this will tell you kind of where you stand um, with respect to that uh, that, that metric. Um, we've got, yeah, so average time per request to, this is the response time of the app. That's a useful number. So here we've got 1160 milliseconds, just, uh, just over a second. Um, and then time per request across all concurrent requests. So this is a little confusing. It took me some time to look into and figure out uh, what the difference is. So time per request is more from the, uh, the user or the requester's point of view. Uh, this is how long it takes for a request to be served. So if I visit the website, um, you know, I can expect a response within uh, you know, 11.58 milliseconds. Uh, time per request is how long it would take for the server, from the server's point of view, to respond to an additional request. So say instead of, uh, we, instead of 100 requests, we did 101. Um, you know, based on this benchmark, the server could respond to that request in another 115 milliseconds. And it's basically the uh, user's perspective time per request divided by the concurrency level, so just divided by 10 here. And, uh, so there's just two different numbers, kind of coming from two different ends of the thing. If you're if you're worried about how long it takes for the user to get a response back from your app, um, definitely look at time per request here. But time per request from the server's point of view is perhaps a better benchmark for performance um, because it's how fast your server can respond to an additional request. Um, that's about as clear as I understand it, which is still maybe like only 80%, so I hope, I hope that's clear enough. I'm going to move on. Um, yeah. So this is, uh, you get a lot of information back from Apache Bench. It's a very uh, thorough tool. Do you know if you can do post requests? You can, yeah. Cool. Uh, I'm, I don't remember the Okay. Uh, thing yeah, yes or no is fine. But you can, yeah. Thanks. And uh, authentication and stuff, does it handle that? I'm going to get into that. Okay. Um, cool. So the, the second part of the uh, what you get back after running that same <coughs> benchmark, um, you get some really involved statistics. And I am not great at statistics. <laughs> but I mean, this is pretty simple. So uh, connect is how long it takes to connect to your, your app or your app server. Uh, waiting and processing, I don't remember now. Waiting is time from the first byte to the end of the response, and processing is maybe 
Now, waiting is time from the last byte to the end of the response, and processing is from the first byte to the end of the response. I'm not even sure what that means. Uh, but total is really what you're interested in. So this is the total response time for your app. Um, fastest request here was served within 420 milliseconds. Um, the mean or average was about 1114. Uh, I'm going to skip this for now. The median, uh, which in statistics is uh, so not not the average, but the one in the middle. If you listed all the ones out, basically the median um, better than the average. It sort of eliminates any outliers. Uh, so if you had you know one, two, three, four, five, eleven, the median would be much lower than the average because it sort of ignores the, the outliers. Uh, and then maximum eight. Almost eight, over eight seconds, which is a little weird. Um, and here, so the middle column is the standard deviation, um, which I'm also not super clear on, except that in statistics, standard deviation is basically a measure of how uh, dispersed your results are. You want a really low standard deviation to have uh, meaningful results, which means basically the results you're getting from this are fairly consistent. Uh, in this case, the standard deviation is even more than the average, which is pretty pretty high. Um, and I'm going to be honest, this is the thing I struggle with the most with load testing, is just getting you know, really reliable measurements. Um, I think part of the fact is that I'm testing on a Heroku server with the free plan, um, so it's not, it's not a well-oiled machine as far as responding to requests. Um, this would be really hard to really to judge, uh, say I made a change and reduced the mean response times by 100 milliseconds. That's still way within the standard deviation, so it could be, could just be the result of kind of random chance. Uh, so it's hard to, to make an actionable uh, decision if you've got really wide standard deviations. Um, and from what I've read, I think if you're, if you're overtaxing the server, that's uh, one cause of kind of wide results and a high standard deviation. So in this case, I might, you know, even 10 concurrent requests doesn't seem like a lot, but I might dial that back and see if the standard deviation um, gets reduced. Because yeah, if, if 10 requests is, uh, 10 requests per second, sorry, 10 requests at a time is more than the server can handle, that would explain the sort of erratic behavior that we'd see then with uh, a high standard deviation. So the cool thing is you get a whole bunch of numbers and you can learn some interesting things, or at least begin to ask some interesting questions about how your app behaves uh, as a result of them. And then finally, uh, at the end of its output, Apache Bench will give you just sort of a uh, dispersal, uh, I guess, or you know, the uh, I guess percentages of, of response times. And so here you can see uh, you know, 95% of requests uh, for this test were returned in about two seconds, which, you know, not bad. And then, you know, beyond that, uh, the response times go way up. So, it's like it, the eight, eight seconds is your outlier. Yeah. Because you're basically serving everything appropriately 95% of the time. So. Mm -hmm. I bet the dyno wasn't running for that one or something. Could have been. Um, and we'll see too as I get into uh, using New Relic to see what's going on there. Um, there's a lot of request queuing. So anyone who's used Heroku, you probably run into request queuing, and it's not. Uh, it just means that the server can't handle the requests in time, and so they're just backed up. And that yeah. would explain why, um, yeah, at, at about this point, they really slowed down. So you have a single dyno, 10 at a time. Yeah. Uh, you're going to get, probably eventually it's going to, Heroku's going to be like, ah, oh, this is too much. I'm queuing them up, and I don't know what this thing is doing. I mean, Heroku has. Obviously, to protect other people in their system, not, so they have some some constraints they put on their own system. Yeah, which you know, fair enough. But if you're using Heroku, that's something you can learn. Yeah, and uh, standard deviation basically is a function of this. Oh, thank you. So yeah. um, I can't remember the, the numbers, but something like 25% are within one standard deviation of the mean, mm -hmm. and I think three or four is 99th percentile. So um, Whatever those numbers are, that's that's kind of why um, why that reflects the distribution, because by the time you get to within just three or four standard deviations of the mean, you've covered 99% of all, right. all the. So say you made a change, values. and that change was say three times the standard, was three standard deviations better than what you expected. 
sounds like you you then you could say that most users would experience benefit from that change. Um, or am I not thinking? Well, that? so you couldn't really com compare them. The standard deviation would change. Oh, uh, yeah. So so yeah, but yeah, you could see if that goes up or down, that could tell you whether whether this is a good thing for most users. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. Um, Scott, you asked about authentication, and Apache Bench has our back here. Um, you can do HTTP authentication um, with just a username and password. Hopefully, we're all using something a little stronger than that, like cookie and session-based authentication. Uh, and in that case, you can do it. So you just have to pass in the session cookie, and you can see here um, you're able to grab it from the uh, network tab of here I'm using Chrome's uh, request inspector. Um, sorry, not the network tab. This is the resources tab. Um, you can get it through the network tab too, uh, and just see. Basically, you log in to the to the website you want to test, and either from the cookie header going over the network or the cookie that's saved uh, on your computer, you can get the value. And then if you pass that into Apache Bench, um, it will authenticate as if it were you and use the app. Um, you probably want to avoid testing any endpoints that send emails or things like that because you'll get a thousand of them or whatever. Uh, but yeah, so you're able to, to kind of log in and, and test the insides of the app, which you know if we're doing Ruby and Rails development. You know, there's probably a lot of logging in and, and things like that. So it's definitely important to be able to test that stuff. Cool. So we've got some benchmarks. Uh, what can we do with them? Um, the easiest thing to do, and as I mentioned before, especially if you have reliable benchmarks um, that have been repeated, and maybe the standard deviation is pretty tight, um, you can change something and see how it affects your benchmark. Um, it's helpful to benchmark regularly, and I'll, at the end I'll mention some tools that can help with that uh, for scheduling uh, load testing, uh, so that you know you know you've got just more data, and so if you're able to. You can measure any additional data you get uh, from changing something against that and make useful decisions. Um, another sort of side benefit of load testing is that you know, if you're doing it against a staging environment, you get data then of, uh, of how people, well, how automated users are using your app. And so you can dig into New Relic, and I'll get into that a little more later, um, or your logs or any kind of uh, internal tool you have for that and see from the inside how your app's behaving under a ton of traffic. Um, and then finally, there's stress testing. So I probably, even with 10 concurrent users, was stress testing my app to some extent. Uh, but you know, say you, you hit a nice, comfortable benchmark, you can always dial it up and say, OK, how does my app behave when it runs out of database con connections, or you know, the uh, dyno, or whatever the uh, front end you know, can't respond or request fast enough. When you hit the front page of Reddit. Yes, exactly, which it's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> I don't speak from experience, obviously. All right, so that's Apache Bench. Um, it's been around forever. It's solid. It gives you some useful metrics. There's a somewhat newer tool called Siege, which I've used. It's, it's got a nice API, um, or nice interface, I should say. Uh, it doesn't give you quite the detailed metrics as Apache Bench, but it's got some additional features which make it really handy for simulating kind of real world conditions. And I'll get into what some of those are in a moment. Um, first, here's a basic, uh, basically the same load test with Siege. Uh, by the way, Siege, uh, I know you can install with Homebrew, uh, Brew install Siege. I believe there's a Windows port too um, that runs under SigWin if, you, if you're on Windows. Um, and the siege command, so it uses uh, R is reps. And so whereas with Apache Bench, uh, and they both have a lot of other um, flags you can pass in. Apache Bench, I did the total number of requests and then the concurrency. With siege, uh, the reps is the number of repetitions, and C is concurrency again. So this, this is going to be 100 requests, 10 at a time. But the way siege thinks about it is it's 10 requests at a time, 10 times, which adds up to 100, uh, or multiplies out to 100. Anyway, um, running Siege against the same endpoint, uh, you can see kind of the output you get. It's a little more brief, but a lot of the same metrics here. Um, availability, which is you know error rates and things like that. 
We've got longest and shortest transactions. Uh, so transaction rate, I believe that was the same entry we saw for Apache Bench. Uh, so if you want to see how many requests per second you're able to handle. And then response time, which I can only assume is an average. Uh, yeah. Siege also can handle authentication. Um, basically the same way, actually a different way uh, as Apache. In this case, you're actually using the HTTP authentication in the URL, uh, which I believe most browsers will send that as a, a header. Uh, but you can also do uh, session-based authentication through a very similar kind of way. You get the cookie from making a successful request and inspecting uh, your, your browser. And then instead of just passing in the cookie, you're passing in a header, uh, and it's a cookie header. So basically, this part's new, but the rest is all the same uh, as Apache Bench. And in this case, then you can test uh, URLs behind authentication. Siege also has a feature that I've not used um, in a, you can create a configuration file and add, I believe, the login endpoint, uh, username and password, and Siege will hit that and log in before every request. So if you're only testing pages that require authentication, um, you can do that and have Siege kind of automatically log in before hitting those. Uh, Siege has two advantages that, as I mentioned, make it a really useful tool for simulating real-world uh, user loads. The one is that you can test multiple URLs uh, in sequence in a single test. And you do that just by passing in, instead of a URL as the final command line argument, uh, you pass in the, uh, the text file, or any file really, that contains um, just a list of URLs on each line uh, with the F flag. Uh, so that's great where say, I mean, you've got a website with hundreds of pages. You could even do a, a web crawl and put all hundred of those pages inside your, uh, the file that you passed to Siege and test every page on your website. Um, or if you have just some key pages, um, Siege is great because compared to the Apache Bench where you can only test one at a time, here you're simulating people on multiple pages and so there's certain uh, probably race conditions that you can bring to light uh, by having a lot of different web pages instead of the same one over and over again being tested. Um, you can take your logs too and filter them out and just simulate real world traffic over and over. Is it coming in? Uh, if you took your log files yeah. and you pulled just the URLs out oh, and gotcha. you just simulate how actual people used it at a point in time. That's, that's a really great tip. I like that idea. Um, Siege also can introduce a random delay. So say you're browsing a website, sometimes you see something you like, sometimes you see something you don't. You might wait a few seconds before clicking or you might click immediately. Um, Siege, uh, with, with the D flag, um, here I'm doing a delay of five, uh, five seconds. It will introduce a delay of one up to N, N being the number you pass in. So between one and five seconds between requests. Um, so for here I've, I've upped the concurrency because instead of uh, Instead of hitting all those URLs immediately in sequence, Siege is going to wait. So I figured it could handle a little more, um, more users at once. And yeah, so this will just add a little bit of um, random randomness to your load testing, uh, which might uh, might reveal interesting things about your app's behavior. Uh, so here, uh, you can do this with Apache Bench. Um, I just happen to talk about it in the Siege section. But uh, like I said, one of the cool side effects of load testing is that you're generating all this traffic. And so you can log into uh, whatever your instrumentation tool is and see from the inside how your app's behaving uh, under load. Here, I ran a five minute test with Siege. Uh, definitely helps to have longer uh, data periods, especially with something like New Relic where the graphs only, um, you know, they've only got so much resolution. So here's five minutes of my beta site. And you can see, you know, in a big way, request queuing and just an inability to handle, um, to keep up with all the requests is what's causing a lot of the, the load time delays. But, you know, beyond that, most of the time is being spent in Ruby, a little bit in the database, tiny bit in the caching layer. Um, so it's useful data that you can kind of, uh, you know, so you might try this on a staging site and see, whoa, the database, layer got really fat. And, uh, and so that would be a clue to kind of look into it before you push to production and have to deal with it then. 
another really handy thing is looking at uh, memory usage and New Relic, especially if you're on Heroku, has a, an instances tab where you can see for your app, um, this was right after the deploy, and then you know this is what you want to see where memory kind of rises and stays pretty steady. Five minutes is also a fairly short time to be doing uh, any kind of memory measurement. Uh, but you know, if we saw this and saw memory kind of climbing, that would be an indication that maybe the app has a memory leak. And that's not something you necessarily notice just by testing yourself in development or staging. And finally, uh, one of my favorite uh, tools that New Relic offers is the transaction tracer. So you can see for all the stuff going on on your website, what's taking up the most time. And here, so this is the home page. Um, I should mention, uh, when we pass in that file with all the URLs to Siege, um, it's going to hit each one in sequence, uh, which means that it will have hit all the URLs in equal number of times. So it's not, you know, if you're looking at production data, you might, your, your home page might be taking up the most time, but that's because it gets the most traffic. In this case, we know each of these pages was hit in equal number of times during this load test. So post controller index, which is the home page, um, is definitely the one taking up the most time. And you can see kind of you know the breakdown of where where that time is being spent. All right, so how am I doing on time? I should don't stop me. Bit. Good. All right. Uh, so that's Apache Bench and Siege. Great for generating traffic, throwing it at your app. Uh, there's a few shortcomings they have as far as really simulating real world traffic. The first is that it's a single HTTP request. So you're downloading the HTML of the web page, but you know, not downloading the CSS, the JavaScript. Um, so real world traffic, you know, one request to the home page might generate a dozen requests to all the different assets, it depends on. Uh, there's also no continuity between requests. So you know, every time Siege or Apache Bench hits a, a web page, it has no sense of where it's been. There's no caching going on. Um, and then finally, reporting tools for those two. You get some great statistics, but um, you know, there are numbers on a, on a page. Uh, it could be better. And JMeter, another tool from Apache uh, written in Java, addresses all of these things. Um, it really simulates uh, almost a browser um, visiting all these pages. It keeps track of cookies. It keeps track of caching. Uh, it gives you a ton of great reports and sort of plugins where you can add and remove reports in order to uh, see the data you're interested in. Uh, yeah, so we'll go through this real fast. So I mentioned it's a Java app. You need to have Java installed to use it. Fortunately, Java is available on all the platforms. Uh, but then once you have Java, if you're on a Mac, you can use Homebrew just to install JMeter. Super easy. And you run it with the JMeter command. Um, by default, JMeter is going to open up a GUI. GUIs are as gross as they sound. Uh, <laughs> ouch. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it looks like a Java app. It's got a lot of buttons. It's sort of confusing. Fortunately, the folks at Flood.io, which is an automated load testing service, uh, created a Ruby DSL packaged as a gem called Ruby JMeter, and it's wonderful. Um, so not only can you save your uh, JMeter load test DSL configuration in source control uh, or share and everything. It's Ruby, so it's nice to work with. Um, it basically is just a bunch of nested blocks where you're describing the various aspects of your test plan, which is just you know all the different things going on in your load test. Um, and so the way I found it's easiest to use it uh, is just to create a Ruby file. You require Ruby JMeter, and then you use the DSL methods to build your load test. I'm going to get into that. And then, oh, just to run the test, um, you basically make the file executable and run it uh, through the command line. So here's the basic structure. Um, I put my shebang on top, so I don't have to do Ruby and then the file name. Um, and then the entire test is going to be in a test block. Um, you've got some default stuff. Uh, domain is really the only required one. Um, and then cookies, uh, if you call the cookies method here, it's going to set up a cookie store, which basically for, um, well, so threads is uh, JMeter's uh, concurrency thing. So basically every simulated user is a thread. Um, and you can say how many threads you want running at the same time. And that's how many concurrent requests it's going to generate. 
Um, each thread has its own cookie store. So a simulated user, um, once it logs in, that cookie gets saved and it can authenticate any future requests. Um, however, with threads, you run a bunch of concurrent threads, but then once, you know, say you're running 10 concurrent threads, once they're finished, you're going to start another iteration. And so uh, here I just use the clear each iteration uh, option so that it forgets all those cookies once that thread starts over. Otherwise, you know, you might visit a login page and you're already logged in and different things happen. Basically, it just gives you a fresh start after each loop. Um, and then finally, there's the report methods. Um, view results tree is just going to give you a result. Uh, well, it's, it's a tree structure of each request. And then you can uh, kind of, and I'll, I've got some pictures later. You can dig into each request and see all the sub requests. So visited the home page, downloaded the CSS file, downloaded the JavaScript, et cetera. Uh, and then summary report is just some basic statistics. Uh, the reports get pretty deep. Um, there's a whole bunch of other ones. The thing to remember, though, is that um, at least with JMeter, reports take some processing power to generate. And so you want to kind of keep them to a minimum, uh, especially if you're doing high volume load testing. Otherwise, it'll just take up extra cycles and slow down your load test. Finally, this entire test block has an ugly end dot at the end where you can either call JMX, uh, which is the method that generates the XML configuration file, which is what JMeter kind of uses to uh, represent this test internally. Uh, or you can just call run, which generates the XML file and then immediately opens it in JMeter so that you can start running it. Um, I'm going to call GUI true, which basically when you run this load test, it's going to open the um, JMeter GUI and you can see sort of what's going on as it's running. It's great for debugging things. Uh, however, it also um, slows things down. So if you're doing a high volume load test, you'll leave this off and it'll just run uh, silently in the background. So back here, we've got the commented out uh, threads block and that gets a little bigger here. Um, so here I'll describe, so uh, first of all, how many threads? I'm gonna do 10 concurrent uh, and then just one, uh, one at a time, uh, I'm sorry, one loop. So it's going to do 10 requests and then finish um, just for testing. Uh, and then within that block, you describe the configuration for each individual thread or simulated user. Um, especially for testing on Rails, uh, there's some important stuff here. The first is that any uh, post requests that a Rails app initiates, you guys probably know, um, needs a CSRF token uh, in order to prevent cross-site request forgery, uh, which basically means you can't just hit a post endpoint and make things happen. You've actually got to be on the page and uh, basically just make sure that any post requests are initiated from your app and not from some server somewhere else. <coughs> so we need to capture that. Fortunately, JMeter has a tool uh, where we uh, basically catch it with a regular expression and save it in the authenticity token variable, which we'll use later. And this just means anytime we visit a page, um, whether or not we're going to initiate a post request or not, we'll have that authenticity token. And so Rails knows this request is legit. Uh, think time is a, a cool feature of JMeter, uh, sort of similar to Siege's delay, uh, but a little more configurable. The two arguments, the first is the average think time. So you know, each thread or simulated user is going to take on average three seconds, uh, this is in milliseconds, between making requests. But that's going to vary by two seconds. So it might be one second, it might be five, uh, which just introduces some variability. And that's always good for trying to simulate human beings. And then yeah, finally, the threads block is going to end with a transition, or sorry, transaction block. And this is going to be just a list of steps for each simulated user to take in the app. And a little bit bigger, here's how it looks. Um, you could have multiple transaction blocks. Um, you give them a nice name. And it's going to have, there's two methods, uh, two block methods you can call here. Visit is a get request. And submit is a post request. So here we're going to visit the login page. Um, forget the assert for now. Uh, then we're going to submit a post request. Uh, this actually should be it's the same URL, just via post, but forget about that. Um, and then we're going to so basically simulate filling in the login form for the website. 
you'll see both of these have an assert, uh, assert declaration, uh, and that just checks the response that you get and makes sure it's the one that you're expecting. Uh, so basically, uh, I had some trouble sort of debugging these where there'd be a redirect maybe because authentication failed and I would be submitting requests and wouldn't know why they were failing and it turns out I was on the wrong page. So I found uh, this is a really useful feature just to make sure um, if for some reason you're not on the page or the, the simulated user isn't on the page where you expect, it's going to fail uh, with the assertion instead of some other error down the stack that you're going to have to take a lot of time figuring out why you're getting it. Um, so basically just assert that this page contains the word sign in and once we log in, it should take you to the dashboard and we'll just make sure it says dashboard here. Um, these should look pretty familiar. Um, a typical device login form, um, especially with Rails, you've got your UTFA token. Um, here's the authenticity token that we captured earlier with each request. We're going to pass that in um, and then the, the dollar sign angle or the dollar sign braces syntax is just uh, how Jamie would like it. Uh, we're going to pass in a username, I'm sorry, an email and a password. And a note about this, uh, if your app allows registration, you may want to skip this step and just have the user register before they start interacting with the app. Um, the one that I'm testing doesn't, so I went in, created a test user uh, for the purposes of this load test, and that's the, the credentials that I'll be using. Um, yeah, so here's our transaction block. And so basically, once you get that entire DSL and you run it in JMeter, it's going to open up the, the GUI. And here's what it's going to create. This is JMeter's representation of the test plan. And it, it should look pretty familiar. Um, this is uh, basically all the things that we specified in the DSL, but represented in a way that JMeter understands. Uh, if you really like GUIs, you could have built this uh, just using JMeter too. <coughs> All right, so once JMeter is open, we run our load test, and this is the results tree report um, that we would opted into. You can see here there's a big list of all the transactions that we specified, um, and within each transaction, I'm sorry, I think, so it's transactions and the, the request, so the visit and the submit, um, you can see here, this is visiting the login page, visiting, uh, I added some additional pages too. You can drill down here uh, for, this was the HTML, this was the CSS probably, this was the JavaScript. Basically, if anything goes wrong or if you're curious, you can see every request that JMeter has made and kind of dig into the headers and things like that. Uh, and then finally, the other report that I enabled was the summary report. And this should look pretty similar to what we got out of Apache Bench. Um, you get your samples. Uh, mean, minimum, maximum, standard deviation, pretty wide, uh, errors, things like that. Um, yeah, so the, the cool, what we have here though from JMeter is, you know, this was actually testing, logging into the app, downloading all the um, external assets, uh, at, probably as close to real human beings testing your app as you can get without paying a bunch of people to test your app. This is the same slide as before. I'm probably just going to skip it, but the same things hold. You know, what can we do with this? Uh, use it to make better decisions or dig in a new relic and see what this slow test um, actually made your app do and, and whether that's what you expect or not. Finally, uh, there's some great third-party tools out there that make this easier and more repeatable and automatable. Um, I've used the first two, loader.io and blitz.io. Um, a great feature that they offer is um, automating these tests. So either um, maybe daily at a an off peak time, or whatever, you could even test your production app or test a staging app. So if you've got daily metrics, you can see Monday, you know, 300 milliseconds, Tuesday, 310, Wednesday, and then if something goes way off, you know, you've got that history that wow, this this really is an outlier. We need to look into why this was different. Also, they've got, they've got webhooks, so if you use continuous integration, you can run a load test immediately after um, a deployment to staging and then have that either pass or fail your uh, CI before deploying to production. So say you've got a threshold of you know, 200 milliseconds uh, 
if you deploy and your load tests are slower by more than that, it won't push to production, kind of send you an email and be like, hey, you should probably check this out. Um, I've not used flood.io, but I threw them in here because they built the Ruby J meter gem, which I like. And it seems like every time I Google this, there's more tools out there. So um, check them out. So finally, um, load testing can teach you things about your app and your code that you can't maybe learn just poking around yourself or with the help of a couple coworkers. Um, they help answer questions as to how many users or requests or whatever your app can handle, which is good to know. Um, they help you make better decisions because you'll know, uh, well, you can test whether something you think will be an improvement actually is or isn't. And they help you avoid surprises. So you'll know before you push production and send out that press release that's going to get on Hacker News uh, exactly what your app can handle. And uh, all that makes us happier as developers, which is goal number one. Thank you. Wait, I have questions. Yeah, questions, totally. Um, do you see, are you, are, you, are you doing this at Lessonly right now? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, cool. Um, do you guys have like a request per second standard that you try to that you try to abide by? We don't. Um, we're kind of new to this stuff, and cool. uh, yeah, no. so I'm I'm trying to figure out what our our benchmark should be. Um, you know, um, we've looked at New Relic <clears throat> production and seen you know our average response time is is this, and so we certainly try to match or beat that mm -hmm. um, with any future changes, but. Yeah, still, still kind of figuring that out. First, do no harm. Yeah, exactly. I had a um, a boss once who was like, "Hey, you know, this page is slow." I mean, he was very technical. Mm -hmm. I could have done all of the work that he was ultimately asking me to do. Uh, not that he should have done it. Like it was. In any case, <clears throat> he was like, "Hey, you know, check out these three pages. They're slow. They need to they need to be faster." And then I called him over, you know, later or a day later, whatever it was, and I was like, "Hey, you know, I'm." I got these all down to you know just just slightly over a second. He goes, look, in my opinion, if you if it's not under 500 milliseconds, it's wrong. I'm like, oh. yeah. <laughs> Which well, I don't think that is uh, any longer a fair benchmark. Well, uh, for one thing, it depends. It, time either, it depends a great deal on how the page renders. So, if you're using one of those tools that actually does the full thing with all of the assets and everything, um, you don't necessarily need all your assets loaded as long as you have done your front end stuff in a sensible way where people see the page pretty darn quickly, even if they can't actually interact with it yet. Yeah. It's like um, you know the perception is so important. There was, there's been some research that shows that when people are waiting for an elevator, um, they will wait slightly longer for the elevator as long as the light lights up quicker, telling them that it has arrived. So you get a nice loading indicator up there yeah. real fast. Yeah, that makes them feel good. They know, they know they're not sitting there waiting for nothing. And they will actually wait a good second or two longer just because of that psychological thing. There's probably a valid point there too with a lot of the JavaScript, you know, full front frameworks coming out now where you, know, you may get a, a response within 100 milliseconds, but that's just your HTML. Yeah. It's then going to load the JavaScript and that's going to bootstrap some other things. And, and Yeah, um, these tools kind of can't tell you the perception. Please. Exactly. So thankfully, we human beings are not out of a job yet. Yeah. Uh, but it <laughs> mocks your point too, and I didn't really get into this, but I mean, there's a whole kind of science behind just coming up with reasonable benchmarks. Like yeah. you can always just pick a number and say, all right, we want to hit this. But yeah. you know, and I find myself, you know, when, when you're choosing all those configuration variables, how much concurrency, what delay, you've actually got to learn things about your users. And you know, if someone's, if people are <coughs> switching pages every 10 seconds and your load tests are um, issuing new requests every five, you may be off by, you know, double because of just a bad estimate about how people use your site. So. Um, yeah, it should not be underestimated that you know you need to figure out sort of how people are interacting with your app in order to simulate that. Um, these aren't a, a silver bullet. Decide whether you're aimed at the ADHD crowd or not. Mm. A combination of uh, of doing this thing and but and keeping that what uh, Davey said in mind. We're like, oh yeah, but you know the perception thing is it can be a slippery slope though, and I've been guilty of this before. Because you start going, oh well, I'll just off-put loading X, Y, or Z, 
So after everything else, like basically making an AJAX request or yeah. something like that, after the page loads, and you're like, all right, look, my, my page loads faster, like I, I improved all these benchmark scores that I've been tracking or whatever, so everything's good, right? But in reality, you probably pissed off a bunch of users, including me, if you're doing that. Like, and I've, I've been guilty of doing that as a programmer, and now if something loads and then says loading. Like, yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. that's the worst. You, you know who's most bad the at that? If you guys listen to the Ruby Rogues podcast, um, gr great podcast. Their website loads the main content via Ajax. So you get like a nice header and footer and it's just empty. And then you see that spinner for a few seconds. Now what I'm talking about is like a whole different approach to the front end mm -hmm. where the, th the darn thing still works without the JavaScript loading or most things work without the JavaScript loading. But you know the frilly stuff maybe doesn't. Yeah. So like uh, uh, like uh, Jeremy Keith adaptio.com. Yeah, he talked about this kind of stuff a lot. Read his stuff. Yep. All he's right. A cool guy. Any other questions? Or? Scott, have you used <coughs> Daemeter? Is that what you guys are using? I have. Yeah. Um, so it strikes me that it's it's way more powerful, but it's kind of a pain in the ass. Looks like to code out all those uh, requests, or do you not feel that that's true? Hmm. I mean the. Go back to the. Reminds me of cucumber stuff. The ESL is not too yeah. bad, right? I mean, you got maybe half dozen lines here, half dozen lines there. Well, maybe a dozen but that was for one login request, right? Oh yeah. So um, let's say that I, what I'm kind of wondering is, I wonder if there's like a um, a browser plugin that could capture a workflow and translate it because that's a really cool. If idea. I have a workflow of ten pages, sure I could code them slowly and like right, but I mean it's like it just sounds like a lot of work, right? Versus it does. Uh, I mean, I like that. And the browser, grabbing the logs. The browser would have access to your uh, the headers that you sent. Exactly you right. I mean, it could just it could. Right. Doesn't Selenium have something things. like that? Yeah. I yeah. don't know. I haven't. I haven't really uh, gotten into this. Right. You can whip up quick. We we should program. we should make that a hackathon to write that thing. Oh, there you go. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of a. a <laughs> Stop, sponsored by Lincoln. What? That would be yeah, a good point. A very JavaScript heavy. Hackathon probably because they'll be writing. Oh yeah. Some sort of Chrome extension or yeah. something. I don't. Re I don't really want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I want. I want somebody to do that for me. <laughs> it sounds like it has some malicious Throw it out there. Yeah. <laughs> Capturing all your passwords. Well, Any other? I know. I enjoyed. I listened to it. I actually had. A, I come from a different angle a little bit, at least from historically. But your uh, piece on the benchmarking and, uh, is I think, really, really key. Particularly, you know, there's a, there's always a I call it holy wars, the open source Microsoft, AMD, Intel, but there's also the holy war between infrastructure people and, and uh, developers, right? Mm. And I've run into so many times when there's an underlying infrastructure change is not exposed to the developer, that then you guys go from off into trying to figure it out because there's there's no there, there was never a benchmark. Or any, any checks to make sure that there's no underlying. Behavior. Yeah, why is it behaving this way? Right. And then if I, I mean, turn that around, I can tell a little story here, right? So we did a project with Lehman Brothers when they went bankrupt, right? Which is a whole story in itself, because if you've ever done business with a bankrupt company, it's actually a wonderful thing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> all your money gets put aside so that you always get paid first. And it's escrowed, so all, there's no like, what happened to my money? You know, it's a beautiful thing, but it was a project in which the, the infrastructure was the same, and this uh, developer came in, and it was probably the most obnoxious person I've ever dealt with. I like to tell you, the lawyers got involved and everything else, because of a particular report was taking 45 minutes to run, and he should, it should be five. Yeah. And we invested 500 hours in the infrastructure the diagnostics to prove to them that it wasn't the infrastructure. Someone came back from vacation and turned off the debug in front end of it, and it in 12 seconds, right? And I never saw that guy again, but, but I think the, the part I wanted to, to stress there is, is the benchmarking on both sides to try to make those interactions more like the facts and not, not the emotions. And when you have it, it, it just kind of deflates everything and you get to the real problem. That's, That's a good, good point. Stuff. Some little contribution. He also wanted, he also wanted to all know that when it comes to developers versus infrastructure, he's going to pick Oh, no. <laughs> I'm on the new side. <laughs> well, certainly, one sec. Um, yeah, I mean, I was talking about code changes here, but definitely uh, 
any time we're making an infrastructure change, it seems like it'd be really useful to have a tool like this at your disposal as well. well I, I sat on an advisory thing and there was this huge debate on the, the cloud hosting providers on whether or not to make a contractual promise of the underlying metrics for the infrastructure, mm. right? Like reads and writes. And if you kind of go and look, if, if the actual, what's the guarantee? Like we guarantee, or you know, let's say we, they guarantee that you can make a write within the next five minutes, right? Or read within five minutes. It's kind of like, what kind of promise is that? It was just a huge debate yeah. about, you know, perception versus reality. But what they really, everybody really wanted to do was the ability to switch those things out to make it more efficient, make more money, mm -hmm. and trying to not let you know what's going on with the covers. So I thought the transparency side uh, and providing you know, the hooks for you each in to know when things have changed so that you can write around it or ride the wave or whatever's going on there. So yeah, that's what I thought. Do you have a question? Um, so just a, I guess a statement. Something about uh, if you're running anything on the JVM, uh, you might want to give it, and I think Jamie, Jamie you're actually comments is it has a ramp up time. You can put it right, on. yeah. Because sometimes that, the JVM in particular can uh, create optimizations longer it runs, and it may actually not be performing the first five minutes or so, and then after that might be a little more scrambled or something. Yeah, good point. Um, there's a lot that JMeter does that I wasn't even able to cover. And yeah, ramp up time is one. Yeah, uh, I mean, I was impressed, and a couple after a couple hiccups, you know, it really wasn't too hard to use, and yeah, the power was impressive. So I've always been amazed at JMeter. Like was intimidated by it. Yeah, it is, but right. It was like, oh, I know how to use Apache Bench, and everybody's saying JMeter is better. I'd be like, oh God, it's a Java tool. No, I'm not. <laughs> See a couple screenshots, forget it, I'm not touching it. <laughs> Ruby Jamie, check it out. <laughs> so see that has the advantage of being Ruby, but then it has the downside of being another gosh darn DSL. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. I'm used to it. That's, what, that's what we do. I'm a I know. professional DSL. Well, our, our, big, our big DSL hater friend isn't here tonight, so. <laughs> um, so have you guys felt some awesome. pain at Lessonly that has led to this, or are you guys not trying pain. to stay ahead More of the More kind of apprehension. I mean, we're growing pretty fast, and you know, we talk to different customers, and you know, the last, you know, what if we want to bring on 100,000 users? And like, yeah. that's not much more than all of our users right now. And so we, we just really have to start digging into, okay, what what can we actually handle? Um, what can we expect from certain kinds of scaling? Uh, so yeah, really just, we, you know, everything kind of worked, and we didn't think about it much. And so now we're really having to uh, get some some data and evidence to, to support. Bets we're gonna make on cool. what we can deliver. You're gonna hit the front page of Reddit any day now. Yeah, I can feel it. I think we're on Hacker News. Got four upvotes, so <laughs> 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 got, got a ways to go.